Can All you right, hear me so now? First, I just wanted to go over a couple of small announcements about logistics. So we are in the upstairs area. This is the TELUS room. Outside is the bistro area where all the coffee and snacks will be. That's going to happen all throughout the day, so it won't be taken away. So if you don't have the jitters yet and need more coffee, it will be out there. Uh, the elevator, for anyone who needs it, is by the front registration desk. And the washrooms are directly at the TELUS room, hang the left, and they're right there on the side. Downstairs are the Gemini rooms, east and west. So when you leave the TELUS room, do a little button hook. The stairs are right there, and you can't get lost down there. There's signs that show where the Gemini East and West are. And one thing to, to, to make a note of, there is a Science Center crocodile that's roaming the halls. So please don't roam into the Science Center because, because it is a huge place and you will get eaten by a crocodile. <laughs> so some other logistic stuff. There are Wi-Fi posters that are posted in all the rooms and out in the main area, so if you need the uh, the Wi-Fi network and the password that's up there. There's schedules posted in all the rooms and out in the main areas as well. And it's also on the back of your lanyard, which you can just flip over and read. So when we wrap up at the end of the day, there's going to be some fun and games downstairs in the Gemini rooms uh, as we transition into the evening reception. Uh, the evening reception will feature uh, Yuri Napolo's keynote, and you can still grab tickets for that if you have them. Uh, there are space in the workshops tomorrow as well, so anyone who's interested in the management workout workshop or the Lean Startup for Organizational Change workshop, you can get tickets for that as well. You can uh, collect the payments right on site. You'll notice that there are feedback walls everywhere. So we have happiness doors. You can see on the door right into the TELUS room, very simple feedback wall. There's sticky notes on all the tables. This is how we're going to collect feedback for Spark overall and for all the sessions. So if you're in the sessions, if you have an insight that you want to write down and put it, you know, did something make you happy, something was kind of like, meh, it was okay, and did something make you sad. So there's a general feedback wall right outside the TELUS room. So any feedback about Spark in particular, we'll be able to adjust to things in real time. And please don't get that sharp. And please don't write on the wall. Because I'm really cranky about that, yes. and I will find you. <laughs> there are also Kugo cards scattered throughout the venue. So if you're having a conversation with someone or you want to thank a speaker for, for an insight that you were able to get, um, grab a Kugo card and uh, give it to them. We can post them up on the wall or uh, just give them directly to the person that you want to send a nice thank you to. Finally, the Spark Award. So the Spark Award, what we want to do is we want to make this conference about action. So we want you to take something away that you can try in your organizations right away. So Sue has just held up some information about the Spark Award. And what it is, you take an idea that you got from Spark, try it in your organization, and then we will be in contact with you if you're interested in applying for the Spark Award. And what that gets you is a speaking spot at next year. So we're really interested in inviting people who are applying these ideas in their organizations. So talk to anyone in a Spark shirt and we can fill you in on the details of that. So what is Spark all about? Well, it started in a uh, Ford pickup truck where Mike, Sean, and I, who are the or uh, part of the organizing team, were trying to figure out you know, all these different communities, the organizational change community and the change, and the change management community and the agile community, they've all got a whole bunch of great ideas, but they're all light years away from each other. So, is it HR's responsibility to make sure everyone is engaged? Well, if it is, then what do the managers do? And then agile comes in and it kind of disrupts the whole show. So there's lots of great ideas from all these communities, and Spark is about getting all these people together with great ideas and forgetting about our titles and our roles and figuring out how can we build more engaged workplaces. And I had a great talk with uh, my buddy Dave this morning, who's not happy with how performance management is working. And he's not in HR, and his boss said to him, well Dave, you've bitched about it the most, you go fix it. So he's motivated to fix how that works, but he's not in HR. And that's really what we want. We want to think about our organizations as communities. So I'd like to introduce Doc Norton, who's going to do his keynote, The Experimentation Mindset. He's the uh, Global Director of Engineering Culture at Groupon. I saw this talk last year and loved it. 
He's been an Agile practitioner for over a decade, and he's really passionate about uh, building organizations um, that people love to work in. So let's give Doc a warm welcome. Oh, Spark Tio. Spark Tio. Wi Fi is working. The information is up on here with the password. It's not letting you on. We will fix it. All right. Yep, I can definitely hear that you can hear me. So I'm Dr. Warren, uh, and uh, so I'm talking to Steve Jordan. Uh, this was actually um, written basically because of a conversation I had with Steve Rogalski in a pizza shop in Chicago. Um, we were just talking about things we were going on at work, and, uh, and he said, you know, there's got to be a talk in there somewhere. You should probably do that. So, um, so I did. Um, I want to start off just a little while. I feel like I'm getting a little bit. Okay. Uh, I want to start, start off talking about actually work um, from Carol Dweck. How many of you are familiar with this, with this work? The, right, so sometimes you hear about this uh, in, in uh, referred to as the agile mindset. Um, what Carol was talking about was uh, the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset. I just want you to go through kind of what happened there. So um, there was an experiment that was done quite a while back uh, where they took these kids in uh, grades when they were fourth grade. And they gave them a math test. Uh, and it was a test that was challenging enough that it was stretching them, but easy enough that they could definitely complete it. Right? So it was, it was appropriate for the grade level. They took kids and they split them into two random groups. The kids didn't know that they were split, they just identified these different children. So okay, this one, these are in group A, these are in group B. When they handed the tests back, they said something to the kids. Group A, they said one thing. Group B, they said the other. Throughout the rest of that semester, that message was consistently conveyed to those kids. Group A got the same consistent message. Group B got the same consistent message. That one small difference one small change made a huge difference. What they did was to group A, when they handed the test back, they said, we did a pretty good job here. You must be really smart. Group B, when they handed the test back, they said, we did a pretty good job here. You must have worked hard. They then asked these kids, how interested would you, would you be in taking a more difficult test. Group A, majority of them opted out of that opportunity. Group B, majority of them opted in. And as the semester went on, we saw those group A's grades started diminishing, their engagement started diminishing, their confidence started to wane away. Group B opted for the harder test, their grades started going up, they started mentoring other children into class. The only difference was instilling this thought that you either have a finite capability and there's nothing you can do about it. You're smart. Or that your capability is endless and you have control. You must have worked hard. This is a life constraint, right? This is a fixed mindset. This is a life free. It's a growth mindset. I found this experiment really interesting. But I want to know more about, well, all right, how is it that people actually learn? What is it that, that what makes this difference, right? So doing a bunch of research, I found the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. It's a pretty common model. How many of you are familiar with this? I'm going to walk through it fairly briefly, but I do want to walk through it. 
Um, there are other concepts that I think are, are similar to this. Uh, many of us have probably heard of the shoe property, right? or things along those lines. The Dreyfus model basically, you start off with any skill that you want to acquire, and you are an novice. And as an novice, you've got little or no knowledge. Right? Um, you have little or no experience. You actually need rules, you need structure. Uh, if you're thinking about, if you're learning a musical instrument, typically when you first pick up that instrument, uh, your instructor is showing you what the notes are. Put your finger here, strum the chord like this. It's all about how there's an explanation of why or anything else. As you move into an advanced beginner, now you've got some experience. You can actually start to find information on your own because you can know what to look for and how to look for things. Uh, and you can actually start to break free of some of the rules. You still need some of that guidance, but, but not as much. Getting into competence, you actually have a mental model now. Now you know not only what the notes are, but you know the scales. If, you're, uh, if it's a bass, a bass and you're looking at blues, you understand what boxes and all of these types of things, right? Um, you can handle the unknown now. When someone asks you to do something new or different, you can extrapolate from prior experience, and you can possibly guess what that thing is that you're supposed to do. Right? And you're capable now of maybe breaking some of the rules and playing around a little bit, but for the most part, you're still very steeped in this is the right thing to do. Eventually, we move into proficiency. Now, proficiency, we're interested in the big picture. Uh, we start to get uh, impatient with oversimplification. Um, we start to be able to understand basic axioms, right? It's really helpful concepts. So, uh, yag uh, from, from XP, right? Yag and immediate. It's something that, as, a, as an early adopter of XP practices, you may hear that. And you may understand every single one of those words. You ain't going to need it. But there comes a point in your experience where you get a deeper understanding. You actually under, start to understand what that means, right? And, and when it really applies. Uh, this is proficiency. Finally, of course, we move into being an expert. An expert now, those rules are all internalized. In fact, you may not even remember them explicitly. You may just know this is the way that this thing is supposed to be done. Uh, oftentimes, early experts are actually very poor teachers. Because you've just crossed into that new realm where you have that really deep understanding, things are internalized, but you've kind of forgotten perhaps some of those early lessons and your ability to actually be patient with someone who doesn't know things at the level that you know. It's very, very complicated. So looking at this particular continuum, I want you to think, because this applies to every discipline, right? Uh, you are